I'm Dryden Pence, and today is Monday, January the 31st at 4.30 p.m. We're going to do one of our So What slide briefings. Now, I'm going to talk briefly about the markets, the economy, the virus, inflation, interest rates, and then a little bit about so what does all of this mean? So, you know, the markets in the last couple of days, last couple of weeks, have been pretty volatile. You've seen these big moves and then moving down and moving down. And then all of a sudden, the last two or three days, it's gone up a couple of percentage points. This is a volatility that we're having that's really fueled by a couple of things. The first thing to understand is that we're in kind of unchartered territory. There's been a huge inflow of money into the market. As a matter of fact, you know, the inflow into equ uh, to equities uh, in the last you know, 12 months has been greater than it's been in 19 years. Now, why is that? Well, remember that thing called stimulus? A lot of people got a lot of money and they were locked in their house. They didn't have anything else to do with it. So they put it into the market. So you have a lot of people putting money into the market over the last 18 months who probably weren't investing before. As a matter of fact, you know, years ago, there used to be about 8 or 10% were retail investors, and the rest of it was kind of institutional or brokers or professionals. Well, now about 25% of all the investments in the market come from the retail market. In other words, individuals going on their E-Trade account or their Robinhood account or whatever, their Schwab account, and doing it themselves. Now, what's interesting is people got a lot of money, and as they got a lot of money and a lot of cash and a lot of liquidity, they started investing on their own. But it may be they're kind of new to this game and that they really didn't understand that, well, markets can go up. That looks pretty good. But markets can also go down. And if they're new to that and they all of a sudden see market volatility and it's the first time it's ever happened, it can be very uncomfortable. And those things then feed on themselves. See, most people don't realize that if you look at it over time, since 2015, the market has had these corrections. There have been nine different times that the market's had these corrections since 2015. And what's also interesting to recognize is the average period of time from a trough to a peak, I mean, from a peak to a trough is about 24 business days. So what I mean by that is the market peaks and then it goes down. And that period is about 24 business days. Now, you know, in calendar days, it's more like about 30 or 40, but 24 business days. Now, then the recovery period back to the previous peak is about 64 business days or roughly 90 calendar days. So the point I'm trying to bring up is that these patterns of, of dropping very rapidly and then climbing back, well, it's pretty much a normal uh, course of action. As a matter of fact, this happens, oh, probably about every nine months, and that's on average over the last five or six years. So what we've just had is a moment of volatility that's not necessarily unexpected or unusual. But for many people who are new to the market, it's been very uncomfortable because they've never been here before. And so they panic even more than they might, right? They see the market going down and then they get very worried. And the other thing is people forget that it matters what time of day. I mean, normally in, in markets, when markets are going down, you see a lot of selling into from like, we're out here in California, right? So from 6.30 to about 8.30 in the morning, you can see a lot of volatility. Well, that's because the London markets are closing, right? And then they close at 8, 8.30 or right after two hours into the market day around here, and then things begin to settle down. Well, people don't follow that or pay attention to that. They get really panicked when they see a lot of volatility in the morning. So I just bring this up so that when you see these market volatile moments, and we're, folks, we're going to have more of them this year. We really are. Now, remember, if you've been watching my videos over the last six or eight months, I've talked about being in abnormal times because all the comparisons are abnormal. Well, here we are. So people are going to kind of cascade on top of each other. Volatility is going to cascade on top of itself. And you're going to see these big swings. And for folks that aren't used to this, well, it's going to be a little rough. As a matter of fact, I want you to think about what's going on. Our gross domestic product has moved from a 2% growth rate to a 4% growth rate. It's doubled. Now, if you're driving a car down kind of a bumpy road, it's bumpy, but you can survive it. Double your speed and it gets even more bumpy. 
So as we move through this whole period of time, what I want you to try to remember is our economy is growing faster than it's grown in a long time. There's more individuals in the market than there have been in a long time. And there's more liquidity than there's ever been. That's going to create some outsized volatility. And again, these things are not unusual. Just people tend to forget about the pain in between the pleasure, right? But this happens again and again and again. So much so that over the years, what we've done is we've calculated, and those of you who have been following us for a long time recognize, you can remember these slides, we calculate the range fan. Every year we go in and we calculate the probabilities of the range of outcomes for the S&P 500 based upon uh, estimated earnings uh, and, and P.E. ratios, price to earnings ratios. And so like this is the one for 2019. And you can see when, when we got ahead of the market, when the market got ahead of itself, it fell back down. And it got ahead of itself and it fell back down. And it got ahead of itself and it fell back. This is what markets do. They don't always go straight up. So they kind of bounce around. So this is when we calculated the math around earnings in 2019. That's what it looked like. In 2020, you know, we had this big, huge dip that was quite frightening. That was an anomalous event due to COVID, right? Due to COVID. But look where we ended up at the end of the year. Well within the range fan that we expected that could happen that year, right? So you can see that. So then we calculated again. We published it for 2021. Here's what happened in 2021. Went up and down and up and down and up and down. So here's the important thing to recognize. If the outcomes that you are getting are well within the expectations that you had, is that a reason to be fearful? If what you're seeing is what was expected, should you be overly fearful? No. You should basically say, let me figure out how to take advantage of volatility rather than be its victim. So you've seen how we've done over the last several years, and we have that. You can go back and look at our videos and stuff. We've been doing this for a very long period of time. You can go back and look at history. But are you interested in what 2022 looks like? Let's look. Here's 2022. So we've had, at this beginning of the year, we've had this big drawdown right? It came into correction territory, certainly on the NASDAQ, very close to, to correction on, on the S&P. It was kind of uncomfortable for a lot of people. But here's the question. When we kind of do the math around this stuff, was the outcome of this most recent drawdown outside of our expectations at the beginning of the year? No. So what does that mean? It means you don't panic. It means you be thoughtful. You pay attention to what's going on and you take advantage of the volatility. That's why we always keep a little dry powder. You see, we do a lot of math around this. This is the chart. It's up there for all the engineers who want to look at it. But we have to kind of ask when we see volatility in the market, why? So let's go to this. Here's an interesting thing about people are worried about the NASDAQ. It's been far more volatile than the S&P. But what I want you to point out to is it's the part of the NASDAQ that's been the most volatile. So companies that make profits, the profitable companies in the NASDAQ, the profitable technology company that are generating a lot of net positive cash flow and profits, well, they only kind of went down kind of closer to an S&P type performance. It was only the unprofitable, real high flyers that really took, that really took it hard uh, over this last drawdown. So it's not just that the market went down, but what parts of it went down. That's where you got to take a close look at things. Now, let's move on. Where's the market today? Well, what's interesting, and when we look at price and earnings, multiples and things like that, remember, it's the price of the stock, right, is, is, is dictated by the earnings, right, do the companies make money times a multiple that the market's putting on it, right? So that's important. That's how we get that. And if you think about this drawdown that we've had, well, really kind of a lot of stocks on average are back to about their, their, their forward PE multiple of 2000, excuse me, of, uh, of basically 2017. So we've had this adjustment in the market and that means that some companies are probably priced reasonably well and they're things to look at to invest in. The other thing to pay attention to are sectors. Not all pieces of the market are created the same. And indeed, when you look at at 2020 and you look at 2021 and you look at where where we are going forward here we recognize that right now in early 2022 
Most of the sectors are down except for energy, right? And that's and energy is going up because oil prices are going up. Why are oil prices going up? It's very simple. The U.S. is producing less, and we've got some global instability. And so, whereas a couple of years ago, the United States was a big enough producer that we could kind of keep prices and oil prices down, and we were kind of the marginal excess producer, well, we're not doing that anymore. And that means that OPEC and Russia and the other countries that really depend on a higher oil price are able to have prices raise up a bit. And that's where you are. So we think oil prices are probably going to be in this elevated stage for a while. So we're looking at this 85 to 95 range. Oil prices are going to be in this elevated stage for a while, particularly if we have some periods of global instability. Now, realistically, as we've looked at this, uh, I don't believe that we see oil prices becoming recessionary, okay, till we get probably 110 to $120 uh, a barrel. At that point, the price of gasoline and all those things reach such a high level that it really begins to hurt the U.S. economy. So we're watching this very, very carefully. But for right now, if you think about it, uh, oil prices at 85 to 95 uh, are, are good for the energy sector in the United States economy. We, the United States, are a very large energy producer. As a matter of fact, just two companies, if you take Chevron and Exxon and you put them together, they alone produce over 4 million barrels uh, a day, which would make them probably the sixth or seventh largest producer in the world. So that gives you an idea of the scales with which we're dealing with. So energy, we think, is going to be a good sector. And you can see right now with this drawdown that we've had, you have financials doing reasonably well, consumer staples, those kind of things are sectors that are doing better uh, than some of the others. But I think that we're going to begin to see things kind of return uh, to a more normal uh, type of market here, although there'll be some volatility. And that's because, like I say, it's show me the money. Companies are making a lot of money. The last two quarters, U.S. businesses posted their widest profit margins uh, since the 1950s. Companies are making a lot of money, and it's all about earnings. So if companies are showing good earnings, that's going to help their stocks, that's going to move them forward, and indeed you can see earnings estimates. Now you've seen some, some adjustments going through here year over year, uh, and all of the data is going to be kind of crazy right now because of comparisons. But remember, we've said that this is going to be an abnormal period of time. But in the end, pay close attention, it is really all about earnings. And that's going to be what drives uh, the markets and things going forward. And again, the big driver that I've said of all of this, the economy in general, right? is that we put so much stimulus into the economy, right? We put the equivalent of all the stimulus that we put in uh, during World War II and, and for four or five years, and we put it all in one year. So we have a tremendous amount of, of money was pushed into the economy, a tremendous amount of stimulus was pushed into the economy, and that's really going to be there for a while. It's working its way through. And indeed, you have to remember, too, that it was just in September that we stopped the extra uh, unemployment benefits, you know, we talked about labor supply shortages, right? And, and that was creating problems and it's pushed wages up and a whole variety of things. Well, up until September, you had a great number of people actually making more money on unemployment uh, than they were making uh, when they were working. If you remember from my video from last time, I think I showed a slide of that, but you can see this massive drop off uh, on unemployment continuing claims that occurred once the excess uh, overpayments went away, you began to see the continuing claims fall off. And indeed, this has begun to show up in employee employments. So when you look at total employment, uh, non-farm, we're back above uh, the employment that we had uh, at the Obama administration. We're headed back uh, more into what we had at the, the end of the last peak. So you can see we're continuing to have employment. And I've told you many times that as, a, as an economist, I'm most interested in how many people are employed, generating money, moving through the economy. And indeed, real wages and salaries are at an all-time high. More people are making more money than they've ever made before, right? Real wages and salaries are at an all-time high. And that turns into consumerism. What do people do with money? They spend it. So you can look at real personal consumption expenditure. Again, 
back at an all-time high. We had the pandemic. We had a lot of panic about that. We had a lot of, of, of really severe uh, hurt and pain go through the economy. But we've recovered exceedingly well. And not only that, if you take a look at total retail sales, they're 24% higher than they were in the same period uh, back in 2019. So retail sales are up dramatically. All of this bodes very well uh, for the economy. Now, what does this mean? Well, it looks like we're taking about the, the, the growth, right? When we talk about that abnormal period, I talk about, you know, the, the GDP growth went way down. And then it's recovered very dramatically. So we went down minus 3.4, now we're up 5.7. It's gonna level itself off here. So people can say, well, GDP growth is slowing. Well, it's slowing, but it's not slow. It's begun to slow down a little bit off of these big adjustments, but we're still growing our economy uh, exceedingly well. And we can expect to continue to do so. So all of this has to a growing economy, okay, plenty of liquidity in the economy, growing demand, and all of this goes into this volatility backdrop, but it kind of puts a floor under it. So we think that markets are gonna be positive, but volatile. As I said before, we're gonna have this volatility as we begin to straighten out some of these anomalies that have occurred over the last couple of years. And we still have some big things out there that are gonna create volatility in the markets. But in general, we're positive, but be prepared for a little volatility. Now, what's going to cause that volatility? Well, here's back to COVID, right? And, and we've seen how we had, you can look at this now, and the, the, you see at the far side of the graph, this is the Omicron spike. It's very dramatic, more than the first go-round that we had of COVID that shut everything down. Now you have more and more people, but remember, Omicron is not as deadly. It's highly contagious, but people get over it, and we probably have already peaked, right? The faster you peak, the faster you trough. The faster you get up there, most people now have some immunity to it, the faster we get to a recovery. So we're getting through this period of time of Omicron, and that's going to, again, put us back in a situation where we'll have some forward movement uh, on the economy and consumerism and all of those things. So the, uh, the virus is going to continue to create some volatility in the economy and in the markets, but it seems to be not as severe in the past because we're not doing these government shutdowns. Remember, the thing that really hurt the economy and everything at first were the government shuts down. And then we had the stimulus to get us through it, and now we're able to kind of go through this next wave of Omicron. Now, let's move on to the other things that people are concerned about that could be creating some volatility. Let's talk about inflation. And the big question is, as we said before, is it transitory or permanent? Or how much of it is transitory and how much of it is permanent? Or persistent, as I call it now. So the important thing is we have to break this up and see how much of this is just a supply chain problem and how long will that last? And how much of it is a real raise in prices driven to the amount of stimulus we put in the economy uh, through both Fed action and government? Well, the big thing to do is take a look at inflation by item. Some things are going up in price dramatically and some are not. We've already talked about gasoline and that's due to uh, global instability and changes in policy here in the country. We've talked about energy. We've talked about... So what is important to recognize is some sectors of the economy have a much higher inflation rate than others. And depending on what you as a consumer are needing, it causes the inflation rate to affect you differently. Now, when we look at household inflation expectations, kind of what do people think? Most people recognize this. Most people think of this supply chain thing as maybe a little, maybe a little transitory. We'll get through it. So when they think about what's one year inflation, like most people are saying, gosh, the, 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 the first year here, we're going to see prices go up like 6%. Well, remember also, you know, during the drawdown, during a recession brought on from COVID, you probably saw some prices move down, right? Because everything got to stop. Right, so these are all relative percentages. So again, it goes back to those abnormal circumstances we talked about. So one-year expectations are high, 
And then if you get into three years out, it becomes a little more muted, right? So the expectations are a little less. And indeed, you see this go through both the private consensus and the Federal Reserve. So the big thing to ask ourselves as we look at these inflation numbers is how does it affect consumers and how much of it is, like I said, the persistent type, maybe that's two and a half, three percent, right? And how much is the transitory type due, due to supply chain disruptions? So let's talk first about one of the big areas that are important to people. So where you could say inflation is three or four percent or maybe even five percent, the issue is what's the thing that has the highest increase in cost? So how, where as you can see here, consumer price index says eh, inflation is maybe 4.2%. But if you think about housing, well, it really spiked up a lot. It really spiked up a lot. And that's creating this anomaly uh, through a lot of the numbers. And it's also creating some pain out there. I mean, people, they can't buy houses. Uh, houses have gone up in value. Rents have gone up. Part of this is driven by the amount of easy money that was out there and no interest rates. So you had a lot of demand cycle going into housing uh, to, to buy houses before uh, uh, people could you know, actually catch up to that price increase. And so these numbers are driven by owner's equivalent, right? So what I'm trying to say here is that you have housing prices and expectations of housing prices going up much faster than the normal inflation rate. And that's feeding itself through to higher expectations. Now there's a little good news on this because you can see it's beginning to moderate. It's beginning to moderate. Uh, apartment rents are beginning to come down a little bit. The month over month change is, is flattening out. Instead of going up every month, it's flattening out, maybe even going down some. So there's some seasonal adjustments here, but the point of the matter is, is, is maybe we're beginning to see this spike come off a little bit in housing. That's kind of good. That means maybe this inflation thing not is as, as bad as everybody thinks it is. Now let's talk about um, supply chain. The greatest illustration of supply chain that we're using here has to do with, say, the ships and, and the supply chain disruptions on the West Coast. Now, the bottom line is they come out and say, see, look, we don't have any more supply ships. Uh, all these container ships have cleared out of the harbor. Uh, we came in and we've had policy changes. The administration's come in and they've changed and they've sa saved all this uh, situation. And now we've solved the supply chain problem. Um, unfortunately, that is inaccurate, okay? Because what they did is they just told that it was a bad image to see all these ships backed up in LA Harbor. And nobody wanted that on the front page of the paper. So they pushed all the ships 40 miles offshore. They're still there. The supply chain problem at the West Coast ports is not resolved. It's going to take much longer than people are saying. To solve this problem. And there's the picture of it. Well, if you don't believe that picture, try this picture. This is ships just cruising around, waiting 40 miles offshore, waiting to come into a berth, right? This looks like kind of the backup at rush hour at John F. Kennedy Airport, New York. So the important thing to recognize here is that we don't believe the supply chain disruption portion of inflation is going to go away anytime early in 2022. We think it's going to be 2023 or 2024. I mean, that's not necessarily good news, but if we know it and understand it, we can prepare better and invest around it. The other thing to recognize is that when we look at, at uh, consumer price indexes and things like this, remember the Fed wanted to have a 2% inflation rate. Well, now they've gotten greater than that, you know, for a few months. It's gone up. So we have a little bit higher inflation rate uh, and, and that's moved on up and it's month over month, quarter over quarter, rolling 12 months averages. We're now hitting up around 3%. So we see that going up, but we also say that some of this is going to moderate over time. Like I said, the supply chain will probably solve itself uh, probably somewhere in 2023, 2024. You're beginning to see some of these spikes in prices begin to moderate a little bit. That's going to be important because the inflation thing matters because it pushes how the Fed raises interest rates. Remember, the Federal Reserve only raises interest rates to try to change behavior, right? And so this is why you've gone through this period of time here where we had very, very low interest rates. 
They began to raise them when they needed to in 2019, but then COVID came and then they had to, to lower them back down. So where they were trying to be on an interest rate rising environment anyway, but the Fed doesn't raise interest rates so bond investors can make money. They have no mandate to make sure that bond traders make money. They raise interest rates when they're trying to control inflation and try to slow the economy down a little bit. The, you know, that, and that's the point. The economy is doing really well, so you get some inflation and the Fed raises interest rates. Those are two things that indicate a healthy economy, right? That's getting better. So here's the thing to know, and I'll show you this slide. The Fed raises interest rates to change behavior. And many of us who are if you're old like me, you can remember when interest rates and home mortgages were 6% and other interest rates were at 10%, and you actually thought those were pretty good numbers. But when you think about it now, you recognize that most of the people buying homes today are of an age where they've never known an interest rate. And so they may think that, well, 1% interest rate, they're familiar with that, or, or 2 or 3% interest rate, but boy, my goodness, if it gets over four, then that's just way too much. And that's what this chart is showing when you go back to the behavior that we saw uh, in this group of people between uh, 2016 and 17. When you began to see the average 30-year fixed mortgage rate jump up, right? When it began to jump up to around 4% or higher, you began to see a rapid drop-off uh, in existing home sales. So the, my whole point here is that if the Fed is raising interest rates to change behavior, they're going to get the resulting behavior change at an interest rate far lower than they have in the past. And that's important. So as you see people raise interest rates, I don't think you need to worry about uh, home mortgages going to six or seven or eight percent or interest rates getting up to 10 percent. I think what you're going to see is the Fed's going to raise interest rates until they get the change in behavior. And when they do, that's when they'll stop. And they'll do so at lower levels than one can expect. So that's the way we kind of see this behavioral aspect of it. Now, the other thing is to ask ourselves, well, how do stocks do in an inflationary environment? We have an inflationary environment. It's here. And if you look at these sections, it's, it's, not that, it's not that stocks do horribly in an inflationary environment. Some stocks do better on the average than others. So you can kind of take a look at these segments of the companies that tend to do well or the sectors that tend to do well in an inflationary environment. So we can't necessarily change the environment we're in, but we can make wise decisions based on assessing that environment. Now, what does this all mean? Well, it means that for 2022, we think we're in a consolidation market. What I mean by that is earnings are going to continue to rise, but we may not get the same multiple expansion that we've had in the past. So multiples, as people are looking out in the future, they may come down a little bit, but as earnings go up, we see kind of a stabilized market. We see kind of a stabilized market, and we think it's positive, but it's probably not going to be these double-digit markets or high double, or like it's like the 20% markets that you've seen. We don't think that that's that that's a, a likelihood here. We're looking at a market that probably is a position to be in a, a single digit or very low double digit uh, market on the S&P throughout the year. It's probably gonna be muted. This is a consolidation market and it's driven very much by earnings. That's the thing to pay attention to. So what? Well, we're positive uh, in 2021 because stimulus and recovery. We think that the virus is resurgent, but it's not as, as deadly. It's not going to trigger these big, complete shutdowns. So we're going to plow our way through it. Inflation is going to be transitory for a little bit longer and definitely persistent. So a portion of inflation, probably 2% or more, is this transitory piece. And then the persistent piece is around 2 to 3% as well. So this is where we see this kind of moving out for a longer period of time. On the Fed, well, they're very clear. Rate heights are coming. It's confirmed. The question is how many over what period of time? Our expectations are you're probably going to see, you know, 25 basis points rate hikes and you probably could see them, you know, several this year. Could be four. Most people are saying, some people are saying five, some people are saying four, but you're probably going to see these quarter point uh, rate hikes going through this year up until the moment that people begin to react to it, right? And when they do, the Fed's going to be very cautious about this. They're going to be very cautious about this. So then we say the economy is generally strong. Uh, and it is. So the economy is strong. For 2022, we're saying the economy is strong. Markets are positive, but they're going to be consolidated. 
are going to be consolidated. In the end, it's really all about earnings, right? We're going to continue to see some sector rotation. The companies that can, that can manage uh, inflation better, that have the ability to push price increases through based on what they have uh, and the ability to maintain their margin, they're going to do better than the companies that don't. We think that there's going to be some continued sector rotation. Supply chain is going to continue to be a problem. It's going to continue to be a problem throughout the rest of the year. And the companies that have the best supply chain management are the ones that are going to have the greater earnings, right? People are going to end up buying what they can find, not necessarily what they want. And then inflation is going to be an issue at the consumer level. And it just kind of depends on what sector of the economy that's most important to those particular consumers. We have to watch out for that. So again, we focus on companies that can maintain or expand their margin in this inflationary environment. We navigate through it uh, and we try to be wise about what we do. But again, we believe it's a positive year for the economy. It's a positive year for the market. It's going to be volatile and it's going to be one of those consolidation years. And in the end, it's all about earnings. Thank you very much. I appreciate uh, your time. I hope this has been informative. We'll see you next time. Thank you.